Hi, I'm Rob Penzak. And I'm David Tamayo, President of Hispanic American Freethinkers. Welcome to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. We're going to start off with a couple of announcements, then move into news, and then uh, introduce hopefully a good guest. So uh, the first thing we want to do is invite everybody to come to the Fairfax Public Access website. You'll see a contest there where you can vote for your favorite show. Um, so check out our show, check out any others that you'd like. Um, you know, we'd love to get some votes on that and uh, you know, see how well we can do. I know we're in the running right now for show of the year. And yeah, I think we're going to make it. So we need your votes. Go to the website. We also have, uh, we want you to do donations to the Fairfax uh, Public Access uh, which has very graciously allowed us to uh, record this TV show here. And uh, make sure that you send checks. I believe there's no upper limit on the amount of money you can put on that check. So please feel free to put in as many zeros there as you, as you can after the one. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Facebook. We want to make sure that our likes in our Facebook page get as many likes as possible. So please share that with your friends. We're trying, we have a campaign. We have someone that uh, might give us a donation if we go off after a certain number. So let's just go ahead and right, do and that. We're getting really close to 1,000 right now. So again, yeah, check out on Facebook and like us if you like it. Excellent. All right. Now we're going to do a little bit of news. Uh, last week we mentioned that the Ugandan president had signed a law that could imprison people for their entire lives for the uh, crime of being gay. This week the Ugandan minister of uh, ethics and integrity said that uh, men raping little girls is fine because it's natural, whereas you know homosexuality, that's just queer and nasty and an abomination. And you know, it really just makes me think, you know, thank God I live in America where we don't have that kind of nonsense going oh, on. Oh, Rob. I, I, I have some bad news for you. Really? So, uh, in fact, it, it's, I'm going to read it because it's just, it seems to be spreading throughout the United States. So lawmakers in conservative Mississippi have put forth a, uh, another law, another religious freedom law, just like they did in Arizona. My home state for a while. Your home state for a while. And, I, you know, they, uh, they rejected it on the basis that, that it was going, they were going to lose a lot of business. But yet, uh, many people believe that in, in Mississippi, it may actually happen. It's a law that will allow people to reject anyone that is gay in a business. So if you're in a restaurant, you'll not be served uh, because of the religious beliefs of the owners. The problem is that it doesn't just apply to gays. It could be uh, someone that is Southern Baptist and doesn't recognize a Catholic uh, Christian uh, marriage or a Hindu marriage, or they don't like uh, uh, two people from two different races holding hand. Anything that, will, that they can point to the Bible as a defense, they want to pass. But and their so, Bible, and it's important, like, just like you brought up, separation of church and state was not just, you know, it wasn't for the atheists, it was each religious sect attacking the others, and so it's, it's nice to see some legislation that can get the religious people hurting each other again. Now, uh, maybe we should make some uh, bets, and whoever loses the bet makes a donation to uh, Fairfax uh, huh. Public Access as to whether or not the law is going to pass in Mississippi. You know, they have a, a history of doing the right thing after they've tried everything else. Right. Well, and I think at least we don't have to worry about discrimination since, you know, John Roberts, Supreme Court Justice, decided there's no more bigotry in America, so we don't have to worry about the Civil Rights Act so much. Anymore. Yeah, we're, we're done with that, right? So, so we're safe. Um, let's move on. We also want to talk about CPAC. Um, you know, the Republican Party for a while now has been very interested in courting the minority vote. They're just not so interested in liking the minorities. And so they had, I guess there was a picture all over the internet where they had this gigantic room ready for that conference about how they're going to reach out, and it was essentially empty. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, about 20 people showed up for uh, uh, the minority section, and I believe only the, the Republicans that were uh, Hispanic, Asian, and African Americans were the ones that showed up, and that was it. So we, uh, you know, that we do have, we did have some people in there. If you remember, American atheists tried to set up a table. They were approved and ready to be able to talk about their stuff, and then they were kicked out. Uh, and uh, they did set a table across the street outside of the event, but David Silverman, David Moscato. Jamila Bay uh, and uh, Rick Wingrove, among others, walked the hallways, and they were very surprised that they had a lot of support, not only from the conservative right wing, but there were also a lot of atheists and a lot of non-believers that are members of the conservative party. So uh, they're going to have a report next week, right. which I think is going to be interesting. And David Silverman, I believe, is going to be doing some announcements during the week in reference to this experience there. All right. 
So. All right, well, we'll look forward to that. All right, and then last bit of news, we want to talk about Pope Francis. Um, we've talked about him a bunch of times, whether he just puts a better face on a very malignant institution. And this time, he came out and decided to put a malignant face on the malignant institution. Um, you know, saying that the Catholic Church, he really was proud of their record of going after, in a very transparent fashion, all those you know, child rapists. And Jerry Coyne has a great letter out there on the internet that people can read to sort of look into this. Um, but you know, again, we've talked about it for a while. This is uh, you well, got a guy that tries to look like he's doing nice things, and the church is nice, but it's it's all. Spinning. Well, you know, the, with the Pope is very interesting. The Pope, the, this Pope was chosen specifically because the Catholic Church is bleeding members because it's too antiquated, and the world is moving forward. So every time that this Pope comes out and says something, uh, whether it's about atheism or about the environment or about uh, any of these things that the infallible Pope knows about, the Vatican will come out to clarify what the infallible, the infallible Pope said. So yeah. it, it's really s funny and sad at the same time because they still have the same issues and they're trying to put a different spin on it, but uh, the Pope is the only one in that program right now. Everybody in the, in the Vatican is still trying to cover up what he's saying and, and taking a different spin on that. Yeah, I think you know, in, in apologetics they do lots of wordplay and I think they need to really get into that whole infallible thing because, yeah. It's, well, it's, you know, the last common. one was on civil unions mm -hmm. and so the, the latest news is on civil unions, the Pope, it appears that the Pope was saying that civil unions were okay, not marriage, don't call it marriage, but civil unions, so they could get benefits and, and things of the sort, and he realizes that people live happy lives together. And immediately the Vatican came out and said, whoa, 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 whoa hold on, let me clarify about happy that. Happy but not sacred. Exactly. So uh, they, it seems like they, they like to have uh, people erase uh, uh, the videos and things every time that the Pope speaks. We'll see what the next thing will be by next week. This right. Pope certainly talks a lot. Right. Well, you know, as gay rights are starting to get some momentum here, a lot of people have said in 20 years the religious apologists are going to have it where the Catholic Church led the fight to get gay people, you know, embraced by. The oh, they take credit for that for sure. Yeah. I mean, they did that with with everything else with slavery. Religion now takes credit for it. There you go. So. All right. Um, I think we're going to run a short clip from a little update on the Secular Student Alliance by News. Liz Liddell, and then we will come back in a couple of minutes and carry on with the show. to Student News with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm Liz Liddell, the Director of Campus Organizing, and I'm here to share some of the most exciting secular events and news happening on high school and college campuses across the country. In South Dakota, a secular students group was abolished after the principal claimed that a state law prohibited any religious or irreligious groups at a high school. Since this is directly in violation of the Equal Access Act, we are investigating the situation. And fortunately, unlike many such issues, the principal of the school has been very willing to talk to us and resolve the situation amicably. Every year, the Secular Student Alliance has a fund to help get students to our annual conference. In our first two waves of applications, we've already approved nearly $8,000 in funding to help secular students attend this leadership and activist training event. Any student member of the SSA can apply for this funding at secularstudents.org 2014 con. We anticipate issuing a total of around $13,000 in travel aid funding this year. We're also excited to announce the launch of our resources for National Ask an Atheist Day for 2014. This event will be held on April 17th, and students all over the country will set up tables and wear stickers, encouraging their community to ask all the questions they've had about atheists, but have never had the chance to ask. Some groups go further and hold speaker panels and other interactive events on this day. You can check out the resources and join in the fun at secularstudents.org slash AAA or join our event on Facebook. Incidentally, we just reached the milestone of 30,000 likes on our Facebook page. Join in the fun by liking our page at facebook.com slash secularstudents. You can always learn more about secular students and their work on our website. This has been Student News with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm Liz Liddell, and I'll see you next time. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience, and the harm they cause, with a combination of facts, humor, and community involvement. 
They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, or there'll be hell to pay. This is great. I, uh, I love that Richard Dawkins uh, thing there. He's, he's so uh, funny at the end. And he said he doesn't do many of those. I think, I think Road to Reason brought it out of him. Well, uh, well, you know, must have been with all the donations we get, we must have paid him a lot of money, right? Uh, yeah, it works <laughs> that way. No, actually, he really likes our show. And he, he was here at the show before. And uh, I really uh, am very grateful to him for thinking of us and, and helping us out this way. But really, we have some fabulous guests that have come on while we're still you know, very Young. much starting out. And we really do appreciate uh, that you guys are helping us get some visibility and that we can hopefully do really good things in the upcoming year. Well, you know, the other thing that I that I like to point out is if you notice uh, Liz, uh, right, when, Liz she, mm -hmm. yeah, when she did her, uh, her little news thing there, uh, she mentioned 30,000 likes in, uh, in their Facebook page. So I think we need to talk to her and see how she can help us over here and get some more likes for yeah. our show. I think she's definitely done a wonderful job. Uh, last time I saw her about six months ago, uh, I couldn't uh, stop talking to her. She's just a fountain of information. And uh, I hope that she continues working with the Secular Student Alliance for a long time. Right. And we'd like to thank Larry Mendoza on the show for helping really get that set up and running. Um, you know, we really are looking forward to that partnership. Oh, yes. I think it's going to be great. I mean, anytime you work with young students, you are ensuring that this movement of becoming a you know, more secular country that is, that is more based on uh, reason and uh, uh, rational thought, that that will, you know, will move forward. That's the part that worries me. I want to make sure that I, when I die, that I see a future, a bright future in that end. In, in right, that we want to see that in, you know, in 10 years, like when you know, Kaylee, that atheist in uh, North Carolina, tried to start something up, that we kind of move our country away from having people start threatening them with, you know, it's the schools being against them and local religious progressives, but I guess they're not so progressive there, really attacking, you know, threatening to harm to a yeah. teenager that has the courage to try to apply rational thought to life. Absolutely. By the way, Rob, you know, you look a little uh, tired, distraught. Uh, what's, what's the problem with you? You seem a little off today. Well, you know, I was all set for the show. And, you know, on the way up, my damn tape player wouldn't work. Was, tape player? Tape, you, you know we're in the 21st century, right? Tape? Are you a digital snob? <laughs> look, wh well, what, look, what is this? A brief for history and time. You said that you were going to get one of the greatest minds in the universe to come on and talk to us today. And so I did my prep work. Was, Stephen Hawking? Yeah. No, 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 no. We can't. We, we're not bringing him. He's, you know, there are other minds beside him that are brilliant when it comes to physics. Yeah, but... Wait, you got Neil deGrasse Tyson? Uh, Holy cow, I shouldn't have no. keyed your car. I feel awful about oh, that. My, my car? That well, well, no, wait a minute. We can't bring Neil deGrasse Tyson. First of all, we can't afford him. He's, you know, he's, he's now famous with this uh, Cosmo yeah, show tonight. Cosmos, thanks, tonight yeah. That's on tonight, so he can't come today. So, you know, unfortunately, it's not, it's not him. We're out of luck? No, no, I mean, uh, we can talk about anything you want. Is there anything that, that you like to talk about? Nothing, really. N nothing? No, we got to talk about something. Well, fine. When you figure out how to make something out of nothing, then you get back in touch with me. Until then, I'm just no, not some, interested. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You thought you were going to get me in that. Something out of nothing? That I know someone that can get something out of nothing. In fact, I know someone that can get a whole universe out of nothing. And uh, I think this is a, a good Krause. person. Yeah, yeah. I tried to get in touch with him. He was like, no way. I'm not doing your show, man. Really? No, yeah. no, no, no. You, you, you get it. You had, the thing with him is you have to uh, get him. If we go get him in, you know, and bring him over here, he'll come. Take he's just a, quir horns? He's a quirky guy kind of thing. So. All right. Well, you know. I guess you're right. You know, they have, we have been asking for checks to come to Fairfax Public Access, uh -huh. and maybe we should put those to use. So, um, you know what? I think we got a space. No, there we go. Ship ready. That, the, the station got the space. They, we they finally came through and got the spaceship. So, guys, we're gonna please excuse us. Now, we're gonna head out for a couple minutes, and right, we're gonna go get. Uh, we're gonna go get Kraus. He's doing the show. You gotta make sure you pull back because we want to clear that monument. You gotta pull back, just ease it up. Oh, seat belt is a little tight. There you go. Yeah, that's just take a look down the bottom. That's oh my goodness. See? We're really there. We're in space now. A lot of vibration. Well, there's a lot of power in this. And now I do have to warn you. Remember what? that red button what by your this? left what? hand? That's a satellite. Oh, no! Oh. All right. It just, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Okay. Up there, we're going by Mars, asteroid belt. Be careful. 
in the ring, there's Saturn with the rings, and there's Jupiter. And yeah. Hey, look, there's Uranus. We, yeah. we found Uranus. You get it? It's like a plate. Stop it. Sodomy is not a laughing matter. Is that God? <laughs> no, it's not. Me, actually, Jerry Fallman. I'm an angel now. And by the power vested in me by Ken Cuccinelli and our all loving Sky Father, I condemn you heathens to. Oh, Bertrand Russell comes through. Wow. There really is a teapot. <laughs> so you, you think that he noticed that his brain is missing now? No, he never noticed that. Man, one small step. He never step. noticed what he was missing here on Earth. <laughs> right, one small step for mankind. So anyway, um, I guess this is fun, but I guess we really need to go pick Let's up go our get him. quarry. Yeah. All right, hold on. We're going to go through this wormhole. I got some exotic Ooh. material. I'm hoping it holds this open. I hope, I hope, I don't, I hope it doesn't hurt. Yeah, I, I was reading the Star Trek manual. I told you really how to do all this stuff. So I think oh, we can be so good here. The physics of Star Trek paid yeah. off. Now look, when we get there, let me do the talking, because okay. I've really established a relationship with Dr. Krause. He really likes me. Okay. So, okay. so if you imagine it's dark and you gaze up through the Dr. trees, you'll... Krause. Oh, hell, I thought I told you... Dr. That. Krause, you must report to the studio immediately. You're not listening, guys. I'm not doing your stupid... Excellent. Beat him up, David. David, at least give me Scotty. There you go. Thank you so much for volunteering to do our show. Hi there. Hi. So, uh, well, it looks like, uh, I hope that didn't hurt when we, when we beamed you. Yeah, uh, yes, I heard, the, I, I heard it. I, was, I didn't mind the, um, the comparison to Stephen Hawking, but Neil deGrasse Tyson, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we're just testing your humor. Great. <laughs> we, we wanted to see if, if you were paying attention or not. I was. But that's good. But that's... And in spite of that, I still stayed on the line, so it's okay. Well, before, before we go on, in case, in case somebody lives in a, in a bubble somewhere and they don't know uh, anything about you, I think I'll do, I'm going to do a little intro just to make sure. So you are not to be confused with Lawrence B. Krauss, who's the economist. You are Lawrence Maxwell Krauss. Uh, New Yorker, uh, American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, who is foundation professor of the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University and director of the Origins Project. And uh, you're also known to be an advocate for the public understanding of science, public policy based on sound empirical data, of scientific skepticism, and of science education. And uh, you're also the author of one of my two best favorite books, which is The Physics of Star Trek and A Universe from Nothing. How many? That's two of your favorite books. <laughs> two of my favorite books. The only two books I've ever read. So, uh, did I miss anything? Did I, did I catch? I'm sure you missed a lot, but it's fine. We don't have much time. <laughs> All right. You know, maybe we can start with, again, I used to live in Arizona, and we had the Keating 5 when I was there. But since you moved in, they've made it where you can get, you know, carded for looking Mexican. Yeah. You can get, uh, it's, you know. It's not my fault. It's not, not my fault. I just want to say that. All right. Well, on a more serious note, though, what role do you think scientists need to start playing, you know, if they're able to, in helping to shape public policy? Well, the, uh, I think we play the role of any, any citizens, so some of us have a bigger soapbox than others, and so in, both, in many of those cases I've written either pieces for the newspaper or, or commentaries for other newspapers or, or gone on the radio, I think we have to speak out. We have to use whatever capabilities we have as citizens to try and uh, uh, make sure that public policy is based on reason and not on, uh, on nonsense or myth or fear or superstition or ignorance. And um, okay. happily, even our uh, even our governor, who's no not very impressive, has had the wisdom to at least veto two of the uh, more ridiculous bills that have come out recently. Well, then I think, I think that uh, I think scientists, not all scientists, I think it's very important that you know scientists. Every scientist doesn't have an obligation to do this, but I think the scientific discipline and those scientists who are interested in public policy have an obligation to do that. As I often say, I don't think all scientists should speak out for the public. There's some of my colleagues I'd like to make sure don't speak before the public. <laughs> but uh, now, but can... I think, uh, you know, if you're a citizen, you have a responsibility to try and make democracy better. And science has a specific responsibility because public policy should be based on empirical evidence. Yeah. Let me... And the scientists provide that evidence. Let, let me stop you there for a second. Do me a favor. Turn the audio off on your PC because we're getting a little bit of feedback. Well, I can't, that'll be fine, but I can't hear you through my, through my, um, 
My phone is very, very uh, chatty. Just so you understand, Neil deGrasse Tyson said he can read lips. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson can read lips. Okay, well, that's great. Um, that's, you know, that's okay. He only pretends to read the lips because Neil actually never listens to what you say. So <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, well, cool. The sound, the sound is good now. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask a question. Last uh, week, I, well, a couple of days ago, I read an article in the State Press News. Uh, I'm sure you have or have not read it since Salah, you know, you're all over the place, but in there it said that you do not define yourself as an atheist, and I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about what, you, what was meant by that, and, and maybe you started believing in a deity, and I just didn't know about it. No, I don't define myself, I mean, by the things I don't believe in, I don't call myself an anti-Santa Clausist or a, 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 a leprechaunist, but, and I don't even also like the, the word is. I don't. I don't like to label myself. Uh, don't take out the, the is and the physicist. Defined, so I don't define myself. It's not. It's not how I see myself as a, as an atheist. It's atheism, if you wish, is just part of my general characteristics of skepticism and relying on empirical evidence. But it's not. You know, many people think that this God issue is is some vital issue that's important to scientists. It's not. God is completely irrelevant. I. You know, I've been a physicist for over 30 years, I've never heard the word God mentioned in any science meeting, because God is irrelevant. So as my friend Steve Weinberg, who's also an atheist, has said, most, and a Nobel Prize winning physicist, by the way, has said most scientists don't even think about God enough to know if they're atheists. Uh, and, um, and so uh, it's, just, it's just not a central part of, of, of my being. Uh, atheism is not a, a belief system, after all. Mm -hmm. It's just a, 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 a policy of, of taking facts and evidence and having your beliefs, if you wish, conform to evidence. No, like, but, I don't even like the word belief. Right, let, but, let's talk, know, things are, some things are more pro probable, some things are less probable. Right, one thing I wanted to have you talk about was you know, the value of science. And if you can contrast what a scientific model does, even if it's not identical to reality, why it's still very useful um, as compared to you know, a black box of religion. You know, how does a model help? Even if it's not perfect, it still ends up being very useful in helping us learn things. Well, uh, I didn't hear everything you said there. Could you, I hate to say it. Could you repeat that? Uh, yes. Can you tell us how are, why are models in science valuable, even if they're not perfect? Well, all, the point is that all of science is based on models. We never have an exact, there's no theory that reproduces nature exactly in all scales. Even our best theory, quantum electrodynamics, which can, from first principles, predict funda certain fundamental parameters to, to over 10 decimal places based on fundamental principles, even that theory is not an exact description of nature. We always approximate when we, when we look at the world and, the, and in order to make something very complicated, simple enough to solve. And our theories get better and better, but the, the math is different than reality. It's an approximation of reality. How good an approximation depends upon the predictions it makes and how well we can test them. And after all, we never, even, even when we try and measure reality, we're never measuring reality, we're only measuring an approximation to it. If I measure your height, I'll get it to some certain uh, level of, of accuracy, but I won't get it exactly. And that uncertainty, for many people, sounds like a, a, a weakness of science, yeah. but it's actually a strength, because science is the only area where we can actually quantify our uncertainty. We can say, we can predict this with a likelihood of 99.75%, and that means something. Yes, most was, of the time, those words just mean nothing. I always find it funny how an apologist, when you say we know the universe is 13.72 billion years to those decimals to a 99.83% chance, they'll say, ah, so there's a 0.17 chance of, uh, God. of that you're wrong, and therefore, since faith knows 100% certain, this is something in your debate with um, Suris, where he kept on going with that. Well, I mean, look, the point is that having some likelihood that that number is not correct uh, is, does not mean it's incorrect. I mean, the point is there are very few things in the world that you know to 99.95% accuracy. I doubt there are many things in your life that you know to that accuracy. So when we can measure something to that accuracy, it's a triumph, not a weakness. Yes. Anyway, uh, two things. I wanted to, uh, first of all, can I call you uh, Lawrence? 
So that way, yes. my friends can I can tell my friends that I'm on a first name basis with you. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> All right. Second thing is, I had somebody threaten me uh, physically to harm me if I didn't read their letter to you. They wrote a letter to you. It's a, it's a short letter, so I'll go ahead and read it, and hopefully, uh, uh, we'll see. Well, that, that way I won't get hurt. So, uh, okay. Professor Krauss, the first time I heard one of your talks was in 2009 Atheist Alliance International Convention in Burbank, California. That is how my interest in cosmology was born. I was mesmerized when I listened to your presentation because I understood the concept. It made sense and it was like a bulb went on in my head. I was upset myself for not educating and exploring what I thought was such a complicated, dry and boring subject as a young student. That, rep, uh, that presentation made me realize that perhaps, had I had the right guidance, I would have potentially made a good scientist, especially when I grew around some of the best observatories in the world, Paranal, Atacama, Millimeter Array, Tololo, La Silla, Las Campanas, uh, which is Carnegie uh, Institution of Washington uh, in association with Harvard and uh, MIT. And I dream of touring all these observatories now that I can appreciate uh, that, that I can appreciate them so much more. Let me know if you decide to embark on this project in the future, and I can be your personal guide. I thank you for being such a great cosmos whisperer. I can absolutely see how much students enjoy taking one of your classes at the university or becoming enamored with the subject when attending one of your talks. Please continue doing what you're doing, and slowly, one step at a time, you can reverse the path of many students not choosing physics, astronomy, cosmology, etc., as their areas of expertise. Finally, I would like to congratulate you on your recent marriage. I will keep up with you in Facebook. Best always, Lorena Rios, VP, uh, Vice President of Hispanic American Free Thinkers and Baby Boomer Groupie Extraordinaire. And uh, for clarification, she's also my wife. So in case you're getting any ideas. Well, she's your wife. You really had to read the letter. Yes. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I. Uh, that that lecture w was kind of an accident, and it's and it's really obviously had a big impact. I never, as a result of that lecture, I wrote that book, and I just agreed. For I, Richard asked me to give a lecture on cosmology, and I, I did, and I was kind of amazed, and have been amazed since, that the literally millions of people who, who've watched that lecture, even for a while, when unfortunately, due to legal problems, it was removed. It was removed for a year from, YouTube, the Richard Dawkins Foundation had to fight to be able to show it. But um, you know, I think it's had over two million views, and, and it's uh, and it's and it's great that your wife is such an active uh, uh, and participant. And for me, when I get a letter like that, to be more serious, it's it really makes a big difference because uh, it's nice to know that you have an impact on people. And one of the reasons that, one of the reasons I do these things is to get people excited about the real universe. I I don't I'm not interested in much in attacking religion as I am in getting people interested in the real universe, because the real universe is so much more interesting. Yeah. And so when I get letters like this, it helps energize me um, to continue okay. my work. Well, I have, my wife wrote a letter also, which is also serious, it's about the real world. It says, uh, Dr. Krauss, <laughs> Rob keeps eating M&Ms and putting on a lot of weight. Can you stop him? And I read in one of your books that we're mostly composed of nothing, right? like quarks or protons really just make up a tiny bit of our weight. So the M&Ms are almost nothing. Any weight gain is almost nothing. Can you explain that to her in lay terms so she'll stop hawking me? <laughs> I was hoping she was going to write me something else. But anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> no, well, actually, the point, well, to, to, to take your question and turn it into something sensible, mm -hmm. um, uh, it is an amazing fact that, first of all, not only do the particles that make up our body not correspond to much of the weight of our body, in, in the way I'll describe it, but mostly we're empty space. So I can't put my hands through my body or this table that I'm sitting, that the computer's on, not because it's full of stuff, mostly it's empty space. It's the fact that the forces between the electrons and the atoms in my hand and the electrons and the atoms in the table repel each other. Mostly it's empty space. An atom has electrons orbiting around the center, but they orbit a thousand, uh, their orbits are a thousand times larger than the size of the, a hundred thousand times, excuse me, a hundred thousand times larger than the size of the incredibly dense nucleus of the center. Moreover, as I have described, if you take those very heavy particles, protons and neutrons, they're made of quarks, 
But the quarks account for only 10% of the mass of the protons. Most of the mass of the protons and neutrons comes from, if you wish, empty space. Because empty space is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't even see it. And we can calculate those effects. And the effects of those fields popping in and out of existence actually account for 90% of the mass of the proton, which is amazing if you think about it. Well, I, I have a question uh, on a separate subject. Uh, and maybe that you don't know much about it. Last, uh, last year uh, at Skeptic, uh, the, at the conference called Skeptic, P.Z. Myers gave a presentation on, uh, against transhumanism. And I wanted to get your thoughts and ideas and comments about transhumanism and, and what you think of it, or are you, you know, fairly familiar with that uh, philosophy? You know, well, I, I mean, I hear the word transhumanism a lot, and like many definitions, it, 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 it's, a, it's a word, and I don't know, I mean, it means many things to many people. Mm -hmm. So I don't exactly know, why, why don't you tell me what you think transhumanism is, and then I'll tell you why I think it's wrong. All right, it's, uh, okay. It's, uh, it's the process of, uh, well, humans have gotten to a point where really even the, uh, the people that shouldn't be reproducing reproduce, and therefore evolution, which, which yeah, we're not talking... <laughs> Even, even so, evolution has really is now being manipulated as we have with animals and other things. So the idea is that humans will continue to evolve, uh, but now they'll start mixing with technology. And then now that we can tweak genetics and we can think uh, do that. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that computers are becoming more and more intelligent, and that within the next in a few decades they're going to be more intelligent than humans, and uh, that they will be basically in charge. And uh, you know, there's some pronostications. In in that in that sense well I think mo most predictions of the future I, I try not to predict the future any shorter time period than two trillion years because anything less than that is doubtful um, but I think that it there there's some first of all absolutely we're we're a, you know our evolution is now affected by our culture and our technology a big deal that's in some sense that's true for animals too uh, they're certainly, it, uh, their evolution is affected by their environment, by natural selection. So, with, so I think humans are, are you know, evolving, but you gotta remember that evolution itself takes place on a time scale that's incredibly long. And so we've only been around, you know, writing and talking and even with our technology, for uh, our modern technology for less than 100 years. That's nothing, that's a drop in the bucket. So, so uh, evolution doesn't take place on time scales that short in a, in a real sense. But, I mean, at least for species like us that, that have a lifespan of, you know, 75 to 100 years. But, you are, but it is a true statement that computers are improving tremendously, and it will, I see no obstruction, I doubt within the next decades, but, but in some time in the future, I see no obstruction of the possibility that, that computers will become self-aware. And when they do, they'll be self-programmable, too potentially, and therefore they will be able to, um, uh, if you wish, uh, evolve uh, intellectually. They won't be hindered by biological constraints, and, and therefore it seems perfectly reasonable that, any, that humans would want to incorporate some aspect of that technology um, into their biology uh, in order to keep up. So that's potentially the case, but that doesn't bother me, that doesn't worry me. Um, okay. I'm fascinated by the ideas of computers being intelligent at some point, because I'd like to know how computers would do physics, yeah. how they'd see the world. It'd be a fascinating thing. Um, it would be like discovering another species, another intelligent species, and it would be wonderful to uh, both learn from them and be able to communicate with them. Do you have any thoughts on things on like the bioethics of things involved with stem cell research, um, you know, push, pushing us Look, forward? I, yeah, I, I don't think there are good ethical issues to tell you the truth. Namely, of course there are at some level, but there are certain universal mores. You don't experiment on living humans and cause them pain. But beyond that, many of the things that people fear are based on ignorance. And, and I think what can happen will happen, except for those things that are so universally disgusting that I, I think that there's going to be self-censorship. So I do think there'll be cloning of different species, maybe even cloning of humans. And I, I don't, you know, when, when when in vitro fertilization was first developed, the Catholic Church, of course, which is still against it because they're always way behind the times, uh, they, they said, we're against it because these, these in vitro fertilized embryos won't have a soul. Well, then what happened is those in vitro fer fertilized 
embryos were implanted in the womb and were born as human beings, and it was discovered they were exactly like everyone else. Yeah. So that fear just went away. And I suspect that, that a lot of these concerns are based on, on, on fears, and the best way to deal with the evolving technology is not to stick your head in the sand or to, or to complain, but to prepare for it, to say these are the possible implications. How can we manage them in a socially responsible way? And I think that in many cases the synthetic biology community is already doing that. They're saying what things are dangerous, what, what things should we not be doing, what, what things might have negative implications. We have to know what the possibilities are in order to act appropriately. And that's what I mean by making public policy based on empirical evidence. Let's understand the science. Let's have the scientists explain what, what's possible and what, what's, uh, what's coming up. And then we as a society have to decide how to incorporate that in our daily lives and our social institutions to try and make sure that our lives are as productive and happy as, as can be. Now, we're going to be going to a break in a, in a few seconds. And, uh, but before we go on the break, I wanted to leave with a question, very uh, important question that was sent to us to be given to you by uh, Dan Barker. Uh, you know that that ex-preacher in yeah. Madison that uh, uh, I hate that man. No, actually I love him. But uh, the idea that he asks, ask uh, Dr. Krause if he's just another preacher since he's always talking about nothing. So, <laughs> well, what he may be referring to is a joke I made at the beginning of the universe of nothing, where I said that I know when I talk about nothing, it upsets theologians and philosophers. Because they're experts in it. <laughs> That's right. All right. With that, we'll be back in just a minute with Dr. Krauss. Gosh, Darlene, it sure is amazing how much we have in common. I know, Larry. We both love three-car pileups. We both were built in Buffalo. And we both know wearing safety belts help save thousands of lives. Yeah, this is fascinating. Don't mind Vince. He's getting over a bad break. I know. Janet's picking up the pieces, too. They're in here. I wish they understood it's all worth it to get people to buckle up. Hey, lacerated lovebirds, I sense a major crush. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. Talk about head over heels. Rosita, mm -hmm. did you know there's a right way to sneeze? <laughs> Let's show them in my yeah. Got it. When you feel like your nose needs to give it at you, this is how you act, this is what you do. Lift your arm up high, bend it toward your face. Sneeze right there, and got plenty of points. A chill, a chill, you I can do it. A chill, a chill, that's the right way to sneeze. Thank you. To learn more about preventing flu, visit flu.gov. Seven thousand high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit boostup.org and take the first step. So I just moved in with this family and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this for his sake. Well, welcome back. Yes. Um, now, we were planning to take some phone calls, but we're needing to use the phone to accommodate Dr. Krauss so he can hear us and we can hear him. So uh, you're welcome to join us on Facebook, send any questions. We'll try to answer those, pass them along, do what we can. And um, let's continue with Dr. Krauss. OK, uh, Dr. Krauss, I understand that on May 27th, you will be celebrating your 60th uh, time around the sun. And um, although that pact with the devil is working real good because, man, I, I thought you were like 50 or less. So that's, that's good. I, I'm glad. Well, uh, thanks for revealing that to the world. I, I would have preferred if you hadn't. Well, you know, it's out there. How do you think I got it? <laughs> uh, the question I have for you is, you know, every time, at least for me, every time that I have a birthday, I look back and sort of do a little bit of self-evaluation and say, am I where I want it to be? If, I, if you were 20 years old and sort of starting all over again, was, would, did there, is there anything that you would do different, uh, you know, looking back? I know it's kind of a tricky question to ask and well, it's, it's, it's a tricky it's a question that I don't 
deal with. I did, I did what I did, and I try not to deal with hypotheticals. I, there, I may have done other things, and they may have worked out better or worse. I've been very fortunate and in, in, in many of the things I've, I've done, and so I'm very happy with um, I feel very lucky. On the other hand, I try not to reflect and deal with the things that, I, that have already happened, but try and think about what I could do next. And so um, when, I, when I work, I mean, there are times I dwell on things, and I try not to. When I'm healthy, I try to just think about what's next. What can I do next? And, I, and if all things go well, I'm never satisfied with what I'm doing. Uh, um, a friend of mine who's a rather well-known movie director, um, always, he never watches when they're done, and he's made about 40, 50 of them already. And when one's done, he's always working on the next. And uh, I admire that tremendously. He doesn't, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't worry about what's been done because it's been done. There's nothing you can do about it. What can you do next? Um, you know, in terms of movies, we want to talk about the Unbelievers in just a little bit. First, I want to ask you about one of the other big projects you've been working on. Can you tell us about the Origins project that you run out of Arizona State, how that came about, um, you know, if there's any interesting news in abiogenesis or any other stuff that you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, the Origins project is the reason I um, moved to uh, Arizona. Uh, the university invited me to come and, and help create that program and direct it. And it's like being in the candy store. It is incredibly exciting because what we look at are the most exciting questions from the origins of the universe, the origins of humans, the origins of consciousness, the origins of disease, and in fact, in some sense, the origins of the future. Every fun foundational question of interest are things we explore. Now, what we do is we have workshops bringing together the best people in the world on a given area. And we've had workshops on the origins of life, early modern humans, most recently the origins of our universe. And in fact, this April, we'll be celebrating our fifth anniversary with a gala event on origins of violence and relevant to a question uh, we asked earlier, which the origins of synthetic, well, the, the origins of the future technology, synthetic biology, evolutionary medicine, and machine intelligence. Fascinating questions. At the same time, we, as we do that, we have public events. And I am very pleased by the way, the reason I'm hesitating is I can hear myself with the delay through your phone, and that's making it hard to talk, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, but I'm very pleased that we can bring in over 3,000 paying members of the public every single time to see one of our events. Up to 3,000 members of the public to come hear science, and that is just so fantastic. And then, of course, we, video, we, we uh, record them on video and in a, in a very high-def way and with three different cameras archive it and people can watch it and hundreds of thousands of people have watched them. So it's really, it's really satisfying for me to, to see the incredible interest people have in this and that, that we're obviously meeting a need. You know, I, I saw you had an interview with um, Brian Green, I think Ian McEwen, and you talked about that. You said what we really need to do is convince the media that this appetite is out there. And um, have, have you made progress in that? How do you get like big networks? I guess Cosmos is starting, but how do you get big networks to really realize there's a thirst for well, science? Well, I just actually I just wrote a piece at the request of Newsweek uh, or Daily Beast about this, which may appear this week. I be, I hadn't thought much about Cosmos in that sense, but the the key point is that the people are fascinated, and the dummies in the media don't realize it. So one might hope that look, Cosmos for whatever is is the first time in over 30 years that that major network is having a series on science. And so we should all hope it's, it's successful. And, uh, and maybe, maybe if it makes money, uh, then the, me the media will realize that science is marketable and there'll be more things. And, now, and then I, of course, have some ideas. Now, talk, talking about the movies and, and media, uh, movie The Unbelievers, uh, that was finished, uh, it, it came out last year, but it hasn't really been really out. I mean, I, I see some private screenings and a lot of people asking for it. Is this yeah, a tactic I mean, I know, to build it up or what? Well, it's, very, it's been a very frustrating procedure. It's been, a, it's been a learning curve. I've written many books, but, and I've been in many documentaries, but this is the first full-length feature film I've, I've been involved with, in fact, I'll produce. And it's been a learning curve. Um, we had our world premiere last year, a little about eight months ago, at a film festival. And it's been at several film festivals. By the way, this isn't unusual that films have a premiere at film festivals six or eight or about 10 months before they appear or are released. It's just in this case, everyone, uh, people got quite excited about the trailer when we released it. And, um, and, there, and Richard Dawkins and I are doing a, a short, small tour in April around the country. And there are some other screenings. We had some in New York and LA. And 
Um, but what? But I'm happy to say, finally, that we've been working with the distributor. It's very difficult to get a documentary distributed, even one which is clearly popular. And then over 400,000 people have downloaded the trailer of the movie, so there's obviously interest. But um, it's taken some time, and they've done world distribution rights. And starting this summer, in various countries around the world, and will only be shown on TV, but, but starting this summer, it'll be available digitally on video on demand, on Netflix, on, uh, uh, on cable. And so it, it will be released, but I don't have a release date. The minute we have a release date, I would be, I w we will all promote it seriously because people have been so interested. It's beyond our control at this point. It takes time to make these deals, and there's an, and, and, but we can say that they've given us some dates in the summer, tentative dates, but I won't, I won't give them yet because I don't want to disappoint them if, if those dates don't, don't you know, pass by. But sometime this summer, um, potentially early summer, uh, it'll be available on all on all the media that you normally would expect Netflix and now do, do you and and DVDs as well. Okay. Do you are you do you have any plans to uh, be in the DC area or come to the DC area anytime soon? We uh, we we, we uh, get asked to do a lot of things and we have received some requests from the DC area to potentially screen the film and we're we're talking to people. Um, the way I mean, look this. It, it, the way it works is people contact us or, or the, the, the directors and ask about having a, a screening and it, it, these things cost money because the, 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 the media alone and getting a theater and all the rest have to be done but we're certainly interested if groups are interested in, in trying to have screenings and obviously I can't come to everyone and neither can Richard but there are a few that we, we've been able to come to and we've, we've done some Skype. We, there was a showing in Toronto at a regular movie theater a few weeks ago and, we, and, and the two directors and I did three different Skype Q and A's after the after the show. So uh, we hope that different groups will, will 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 try and show it as well. And we're doing some. Our tour will involve sort of big university venues: uh, San Diego, UCSD, uh, Las Vegas, UNLV, uh, 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 which in fact uh, will be introduced by Penn Jillette. I'm happy to say. And then Ohio State University in Ohio are three uh, big venues that we'll be visiting. Um, and it just it just. Uh, for better or worse, it costs money to organize these things, and so we have to uh, be judicious in what we do. Okay. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so we're going to try to move things along because we have a lot of stuff we want to ask you. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask about is, you've been an educator for your entire career. How important is scientific literacy? You know, when you try to, when people don't understand what an order of magnitude is, then your argument about why quantum physics and relativity work so well because they show things to multiple orders, how do you, how do you then explain to them and what do we need to do as a country to get our polit politicians you know, better educated and just the general public better educated? Well, I think one has to work in both senses, and I, I personally have tried. I mean, obviously with my books, one of the reasons I write books is to try and reach the public and, and try and explain the how physicists think about the world. It's one of the reasons I give lectures, and also, as you probably know, I write for various newspapers, magazines, and, and I'm, I'm very political. Um, but I also have gone on request sometimes the National Academy of Sciences and other groups to Washington to actually speak to legislators, and that usually means speaking to their aides. I've testified before Congress, once with Buzz Aldrin actually on the future of space travel, and, um, and I think the, I, I happen to be a very political person, so I generally find I write when I get upset about something, and that's usually, usually the motivation, and I, and I feel now I feel I have a responsibility because, um, because I have the opportunity to be heard. Not many people are, are in that fortunate a circumstance. We all have the opportunity to be heard at various levels, but, but uh, for better or worse, I have an opportunity to be heard on a, on a broad, in a broader audience, and I take that responsibility seriously. I think, um, I think I should use that opportunity whenever I can to try would you ever, and... Would you ever consider people. running for office? I've thought about it several times. In fact, come close when I lived in Ohio, but... But I actually happily haven't, and I don't think I ever will, because I think I am more effective um, writing and speaking. You see, the minute you run for public office, you're constrained by being electable. And that constrains tremendously what one can say. And I don't think I could, I could in all good conscience, do that. Uh, I think I can have a bigger effect commenting on public policy and trying to affect the public's views and, uh, and move the, the discussion forward. So, and also, my wife is... Has, uh, has expressed her strong um, dislike of the idea of, of, uh, of running for anything anyway. But I wouldn't have, I don't think at this point I would have. Is there anything it's in just, physics you know, that... You can't be electable and say what you believe in this country. 
Is there anything in physics that explains why all of our wives run the show? <laughs> no, and, and I do have a couple political questions. Um, one is that my you... wife, by the way, my wife incredibly supports what I do, in, in, and in fact, energizes me to do it more. Uh, I um, uh, I'm very lucky uh, in that regard. She encourages me. In fact, probably helped convince me that what I do is useful, and I think that's been over the last few years have had a tremendous effect on my. The, uh, on, on the energy that I, I give to this. All right, well, uh, I have a question on, uh, on uh, the universe from nothing, the book. Uh, it's been a couple of years since it came out. Have, have any of your ideas in there changed or evolved? Or, uh, have, you know, I, I'm sure it caused a shock, especially in the religious side, uh, when every atheist and every non-believer, every time that uh, they heard the argument, well, you can't have anything from nothing, they'd immediately forward your video and uh, send them a copy of your book. So uh, I'm sure they, you've heard some uh, criticisms. Uh, what are some of those criticisms that you can consider valid, and, and has the idea continued to evolve? Well, I have to say most of the, I, you know, this may be, <laughs> may be a more a reflection of me than the criticisms. Most of the criticisms I don't find valid at all. I think most people don't, who, many people who criticize the book, as far as I can tell, haven't read it, um, claim that I argue that, that nothing is really space with quantum fields in it, and I, and I talk about different kinds of nothing. I try to be very, very, I tried in the book to be very clear. Now, there is uh, the fact that people didn't understand that at some point meant that I, maybe I should have been clearer. And so, in fact, in the paperback, I wrote a new a new preface that tried to tried to respond to some of the issues that people had raised about uh, about the, the question of nothing and the question of of whether there was a before in our universe and what the multiverse might mean. These are very very complex subjects, and uh, the point the, the the key point that I guess I wanted to respond to. And I tried to in the preface is it doesn't it's a semantic question. So the question isn't the important question, it seems to me, is not what was there before our universe came to existence. Was there absolute nothing? Was it embedded in a multiverse? Those are questions, of course, they're 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 metaphysical questions in some sense. And they're semantic questions because we don't even understand what the right words are to describe things. The real miracle, if you wish, that's important, that the one that I wanted to address is how our universe the one we live in, with 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, how that could have come into existence from non-existence. That's the remarkable thing. And the question is not whether anything else existed before. I mean, that's an interesting question, and it may be one of those questions ad nauseum, because you constantly wonder, well, what was before that and what was before that? But, the, but there are two aspects of this. First of all, the fact that we are in the threshold of being able to answer that question seriously a scientist and point out that you can create a universe with so many stars and galaxies from absolutely nothing by known laws of physics without any supernatural shenanigans that's the the the, the non-miracle that i wanted to celebrate in addition we have to realize that our common sense language is not appropriate for understanding the universe on various scales because it doesn't obey common sense and even the notion of before may not mean anything because if space Space and time are coupled to the nature of matter by general relativity. So if space came into existence, time came into existence, and there may not have been any, any time before our universe began. So the whole concept of time may be, may be uh, emergent. And if it is, then what do you mean by before? What do you mean by cause? These questions, which seem so intuitive to us, are maybe just stupid questions. And not stupid, but silly questions. And that's okay, because nature on its fundamental scales doesn't, doesn't care what we think is sensible and not sensible. Our job is to try and understand how nature works and try to force our sense of common sense to conform to the evidence of reality, not the other way around. Right, I remember you said that was one of the best things that science does, is it forces us to comport our beliefs with reality instead of like Michael Shermer talks about, you know, you, whatever you believe is what you see, and science helps us get away from that. Um, I, I did want to go back uh, to the- By the way, and, and in that regard, I'll jump in and say it's even more than that. I said it recently, and, 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 I, and, I, and I was worried about when I said it, but science forces us to be uncomfortable, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Because, because being uncomfortable means we're forcing our minds to open up a little further and, and then, then, then our normal comfort zone, and that's what we call learning. Anyway, sorry, go on. That's right. Um, so in terms of 
my train of thought kind of slips well, away very let, easily. Let, let me pick up in there then. Right. I have one, somebody sent an email, uh, as you know, Guillermo Ojeda wanted to know, uh, I want to know as a young advocate and promoter of science, how we can help diminish the large gap in the public's understanding and acceptance of science. So this is a young person uh, asking how, how he can help in that area. Well, we can all become evangelists for science. Everyone has groups of people, either their children, their families, their, their schoolmates. Uh, if they go to church, the people in their churches, they all have a constituency of people that they communicate with. And so every one of us can go out and, and have discussions about the way the world works, try and encourage people to understand nature, tell them to go look at some pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope, excite people. We, we all can do that. And, and, and you, you know, you don't need a big soapbox. I think, I think the point is that there are, there are throughout this country every week evangelists against science speaking out. And what we need are people to work locally. Um, every one of us has responsibility in some sense, I think, again, in democracy, to do what we can to improve things. And, and that means to reach out and encourage. And that doesn't mean tell people things. Parents, your children don't need to be told things. I think the, the your children need to be encouraged to ask questions. And even if you and you should be encouraged to often say, "I don't know the answer." Can can I jump in? Let's out? find out together. And 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 if you want to make people lifelong learners, encourage them to ask questions, and find figure out ways to find out the answer. Um, anyway, be before we run out of time, can you tell us briefly about Science Debates 2008? What your role was? You know what happened with that? Are there any prospects for the future for getting science back into the politics? Yeah, I mean I, that was a complicated era because I, as you. Probably know I was I was one of um, Barack Obama's advisors on science during the election of 2008, and therefore I was in a partisan role. And um, but once, um, but uh, uh, what we really wanted to do was get um, at a certain point. I I, I I then moved away from that and said, okay, what we really want is to get a uh, a presidential debate on issues of science and technology. And this isn't like a debate where you say, what's the tenth decimal digit of pi? This was a, since almost all your questions that any president is going to have to deal with, from national security, the environment, energy, everything you can think of nowadays, mm -hmm. that, that, that even the economy, that's relevant, and in some sense has a basis in science and technology. And instead of having debates on faith and useless things, let's have a debate on those important issues. And so we, cre I, I, um, I wrote a piece actually in the Wall Street Journal, believe it or not, calling for that, and a group of, of, of colleagues uh, and I put together a, 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 a task force and created Science Debate 2008, and it was amazingly successful in many ways. It, it galvanized the scientific community and the public and the educational community, the National Academy okay. of Sciences, the well, American well, Association yeah, Lawrence, Advanced of Science, Lawrence. tens of thousands of people calling for such a debate, and we came extremely close to having a debate. Yeah. In yeah, we're off in a few seconds. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the work that you do. It really does okay. impact a lot of us. Thank you very okay. much. Sorry we had Thank to cut you. you off there. Okay. Thanks a lot.